This is a video on calculating hourly net radiation and salt heat flux. And this is specifically, again, aimed at helping us learn how to calculate these parameters so we can use them later in evapotranspiration formulas, right? So when we're trying to estimate water use of crops, water loss from forests, bare soils, whatever, if we want to do that on an hourly basis, then we need the net radiation and soil heat flux information on an hourly basis as well. Uh, so everything's consistent. Just a quick reminder what net radiation is. Uh, we've covered this on a daily time step, but now we're going to talk about hourly estimates. So it's the absorbed short wave plus the absorbed long wave minus the emitted long wave. And we looked at diagrams of that before, so we know it's a function of solar radiation temperature, emissivity of the sky, all those types of things. And again, in the previous examples, we did this on a daily basis, which is fine if you want to estimate evapotranspiration on a daily basis. But what if you want to get the diurnal pattern, right? And you want to use hourly data inputs. How do you do it? And that's what we're going to learn today. So again, just a reminder in our ASCE reference crop evapotranspiration formula we see there in the numerator there's a term RN minus G that's net radiation minus soil heat flux that's the total available energy that's either going to be used for latent heat flux evaporation or sensible heat flux and we'll talk about that some more in the next sections the energy balance and how those play in but these are really large terms in this formula. So if you make any kind of mistake on calculating net radiation and soil heat flux, um, that'll show up very quickly in your calculations. Now, one interesting thing that we should talk about, when you use these formula on a daily basis, okay, where you use a 24 hour time step, we usually assume G is zero and it falls out of the equation. That's because just about the same amount of heat is absorbed into the soil profile during the day as is lost from the soil profile at night. So we can just get rid of that term and that greatly simplifies things. But when we operate on an hourly time step, this is not the case. Sometimes, especially in sparse crops or crops that don't completely cover the surface, a large fraction of that radiation will go in to heat the soil and that must be accounted for. Okay. Now, again, a little background. A lot of people have wondered, is there a lot of benefit from doing evapotranspiration calculations on an hourly time step versus doing them on a daily time step? And we'll talk about that some more later. Um, but being able to do these net radiation and soil heat flux calculations on either daily or an hourly sets you up to do those kind of comparisons. And this is just a showing you a little bit of data. I'll show you some data from this paper which was done in Australia and on this graph you see evapotranspiration estimated um, on an hourly time step on the y-axis and a daily time step on the x-axis. You see a couple of different um, uh, approaches that they use. I guess the thing I really want to show here is that they give you very similar results. Okay, and This is what most people find with um, using hourly weather data versus daily weather data uh, only causes a few percentage change in the daily ET estimate, right? So if you're a farmer or you're a water manager and you're trying to estimate ET in millimeters per day for your irrigation management system, it may not make too much difference whether you use hourly or daily strategies, time steps. Um, but I think it's important to know how to do it on an hourly basis because sometimes that's important. And uh, intuitively, it sort of makes sense to use hourly data. Why would you not use that information when it's available to you? Um, and, and we'll talk more about that later. So what we need is not daily net radiation, but hourly net radiation. And you can see here's some example data uh, showing um, net radiation. Of course, it's highly dependent on whether it, if it's a cloudy day or a, or a sunny day. It's of course it's very different in winter than it is in summer. This is summertime data and um, you can see the clear skies and the cloudy days very easily. One thing that's unique about net radiation 
data on an hourly basis is that at night it becomes a negative term. Okay, so be positive during the day and negative at night. And that's because at night the upwelling long wave radiation is greater than the downwelling long wave radiation. So there's a net loss of long wave radiation to the atmosphere. Of course, there's no short wave during the night. So that's why you get that effect. So that's one way you can always spot that radiation data as compared, let's say, to global irradiance data. So we need to learn how to estimate these curves on an hourly basis from standard weather data. So if we look at our coagmet, you know, this is an ag weather network and but they're all pretty much the same. Of course, the, the net radiation and soil heat flux are not measured directly, so we have to approximate them. We can see there that the big difference is that we have the air temperature with relative humidity and vapor pressure, but we've also got solar radiation and in this case it's in kilojoules per meter squared per minute, okay, rather than megajoules per meter squared per day. On a, on a daily basis. So we're, that's clearly something that we're going to need. The example that I'm getting ready to show you is right out of this um, ASCE standardized reference ET booklet, uh, the 2005 report, and uh, that's the one I want to use as a standard. So I'm just going to walk through this pretty quickly knowing that you can look at the written materials that I'm posting um, to, to look at the details. So if we look at how it starts out, it, it starts out just like it does on the, daily, on the daily basis. Net radiation is the net short wave minus the net long wave. But we see that the units are different. Again, megajoules per meter squared per hour, okay, instead of megajoules per meter squared per day. Okay, so that's the big difference, right? but still the concept is the same. It's the net, it's the absorbed short wave minus the net long wave. Okay, I'm gonna to switch to the uh, MATLAB Live Editor now. I'm gonna show you some examples. Uh, that's where I did the sample calculations and it gives you kind of the recipe for doing the, um, doing the calculations. First off, let's look at the inputs. So you need the day of year, the time of day, and use a 24-hour clock on there. So 1400, that's 2 p.m. in the afternoon in this example. You need the air temperature, vapor pressure, global irradiance. These are all from coagmat. So that's solar radi radiation in kilojoules per meter squared per minute. Okay. Um, elevation, latitude and longitude. Uh, you also need the longitude of the central meridian for your time zone. That's 105 degrees for mountain time, 90 degrees for central time, for example. And you need the albedo. You could also use the um, leaf area index of the crop to help you estimate soil heat flux. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. So first thing we need to do is get that global irradiance in the correct units, megajoules per meter squared per hour. So that's what's going on here in the first calculation. The second calculation, we calculate the net shortwave radiation using that number and the albedo. So that's just like the daily calculation. See there, it's 2.23. We calculate the declination angle and the distance factor. Remember, all angles in these calculations are in radians unless specified. So this first part looks very similar to the, um, to the daily net radiation calculation. Then we move on. We have to calculate the latitude and radians. And then there's some new calculations. And we have to calculate the equation of time, which accounts for some variations in the Earth orbit. We have to calculate um, the sunset hour angle in radians. We have to calculate the midpoint and endpoint hour angles. Okay, and you know, like before, this is all so that we can get the clear sky irradiance, so that we can calculate this cloudiness factor. Right? We learned that when we did the daily example. We had to do this huge amount of work 
just to get that cloudiness factor and it's exactly what's going on here. We're laying the groundwork for that calculation. Finally, we calculate the extraterrestrial radiation, okay, here. And then finally, we get clear sky radiation, right? That is, what would our pyranometer on the weather station recorded at that moment in time, on that day, at that latitude and longitude, if the skies would have been completely clear, crystal clear, right? So that's what that's for. And we can take the ratio of that to what was actually observed to give us a measurement of cloudiness. And that's what you see going on here. We get the ratio between clear sky, between the actual radiation and the clear sky radiation, which in this case was 0.91. So clearly it was a very, uh, no pun intended, it was a very clear day. Then we can calculate this cloudiness factor which varies between 0 and 1, 1 being clear, very clear. That's what that FCD is. And then finally we can calculate the net long wave radiation. You see a formula that's got the Stefan Boltzmann constant in it, it's got the temperature of the air, it's got the vapor pressure. Again, very similar to the daily calculation. And we see that the net long wave turned out to be 0.2953, so pretty small in comparison to the net short wave. So we're finally able to do the calculation. Recall that the net short wave was greater than 2, so when we subtract 0 0.2 from it, it goes down to 1.935. Often I like to convert that to watts per meter squared, so that's what you see there at the very bottom of the screen a conversion to watts per meter squared, 537 watts per meter squared of net radiation. That's quite a bit of energy that can be used uh, to heat the soil, evaporate water, heat the air, cool the air, whatever. Uh, so remember though that we also need to estimate soil heat flux. Now that's a very tricky term to calculate. If, if some of you have taken soil physics, you know that this is a pretty complicated process, heating of the soil and how, he, how the soil water content and soil properties strongly affect that. Um, but what they do with the ASCE formula is they take a really simple approach. They say that soil heat flux during hours of the day, you just take your net radiation and multiply it by 0.1 or if it's at night, you multiply it by 0.5. And so in this case, soil heat flux was only about 0.2 megajoules per meter squared per hour. Okay. So about, yeah, exactly 10% of the energy they're saying is going to heat the soil. You know, but that's very speculative because it doesn't really consider the size of the canopy, that type of thing. Um, course when you're working with reference crop you're assuming a really large canopy but when you're not assuming a reference crop other formulas can be used and here's just an example um, where you use the leaf area index of the crop to estimate the ratio between soil heat flux and that radiation that's what you see there at the very bottom and um, that ratio in this case turned out to be about 0.11 so almost the same as the 10 percent estimate and you can see then that our soil heat flux, when we take net radiation times the ratio between G and RN, turns out to be about 0.2196, or almost the same as we got with the simple estimate. So we might talk more about that later. There's lots of more sophisticated ways to estimate soil heat flux during the growing season, but um, this gets us started, and this gives us all the information that we need to move for, forward with uh, modeling evapotranspiration on an hourly time step uh, instead of you being stuck with only be able to, being able to do it on a daily time step.